this is the hard part. Oh, we're just we're just waiting on a, a couple of our no, panelists. And no, I know exactly. No, no, no. I'd say it's just it's uh, it's a screen thing. Hey everybody, I should have just promoted uh, Senator Rivera to be a panelist, but and there he is. Yeah, Very good. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Great. So um, let's see. I think we're I think we're almost ready to start. I, I think uh, I'm still I think we're still waiting for um, Assemblyman Gottfried, as I understand. Um, and he should be with us in a minute. So I'm going to get started with our introductions uh, in just a minute. Um, we have a great uh, a great set of us attendees. So thank all of you for for coming today. We're really excited about this conversation. Um, we always at PCDC here are interested in talking about primary care, and this is a great opportunity for us for us to do that. So. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and, and we'll organize uh, this around um, around everyone's time. But but we have a great listening audience, and we have a great set of, uh, of panels. Um, and and we're here today to talk about uh, a pending bill in the in the New York State Legislature, and to ask for our, uh, your support. Um, I want to give a special thank you to our bill sponsors. Um, uh, a shout out to. Uh, to Assemblyman Gottfried for his championship of primary care over what I believe is 52 years that you've been in this New York State Legislature. So I have it on good authority. That. He's only supported primary care for 51 of those years. I just want to, <laughs> okay. So oh, oh, oh really? Say, okay. He was undecided the first year, but then the second year he came around. I, I have it on good authority. That's all I can say. So okay. 50, all right. 51 good, years. Good enough. Um, uh, <laughs> And also uh, to you, uh, Senator Rivera. So the Bronx is in the house. We know that you've been an uh, important champion of primary care in, in, in the Bronx um, and around the state. And for that, we, we thank you. Um, and we also want to thank uh, two uh, primary care doctors who are joining us today. So we have um, uh, Dr. Uh, Pascal Cursant, uh, as well as um, uh, Dr. Uh, John Ruggie both of whom provide primary care or who have provided primary care over their long careers uh, in rural upstate New York on the one hand and in, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn on the other hand. Um, let me just say a few words of introduction. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, the Primary Care Development Corporation is a community development financial institution born and bred here in New York State with the mission of improving the health of communities through investment, technical assistance and policy that advances primary care. You know, we believe that primary care is the load bearing beam of the healthcare system. It saves lives, it improves individual and community health, and it, it is unequivocally central to health equity. But New York, as many states, has a problem, which is that many New Yorkers lack real access to primary care in their communities. And this is especially true for BIPOC and rural communities. And the fact is that we simply do not value primary care. You know, you talk to anyone and pretty much they say, oh, primary care is so important. But when the time comes to share out the resources, primary care loses out every single time. And in fact, primary care gets about five to seven cents on the healthcare dollar in spite of its role in preventing disease and saving lives. And it's the only part of the healthcare system that reduces death uh, from any cause, uh, cancer, heart disease, maternal mortality, and so forth, not by treating people at the end of their lives, or once they already have severe disease, but by preventing disease, by identifying it early and getting people on a path to wellness. And we think that, that this is really the way in which we want to be thinking about um, primary care. And so we're here today to talk about how to upend the status quo, which is I know something that, uh, that both Dick Gottfried and Gustavo Rivera are, are good at, which is upending the status quo, saying this is not good enough, we need to change, we need to do something better. So we have a bill, and I'm going to ask Jennifer to just put up the uh, one slide very quickly uh, about our bill, which is basically a bill that uh, would bring together stakeholders, health officials uh, in government, uh, healthcare officials outside of government, primary care providers, most centrally, consumer advocates and other stakeholders, 
to essentially look at the data on primary care across all payers in New York State and to make concrete recommendations about how we can improve the investment that we have in primary care. And so, uh, so um, I'm gonna turn it over now to the bill sponsors to talk about why they're sponsoring this legislation, why they think it's so important and why you all think the primary care is so critical to, to primary care providers. So, so first let me ask uh, Assemblyman Dick Gottfried, Chair of the Assembly Health Committee, uh, one of the, the really the foremost state health policy leaders, not only in New York State, but in the country, and someone who has committed himself to this work uh, for many, many years. And so please, um, please tell us a little bit about this bill and why you're supporting it. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Louise. Uh, you know, I agree with everything you said about, uh, about primary care and the need for it and the value of it uh, and the severe under underfunding uh, and under emphasis uh, on it. Uh, you know, we've been at this for a long time in New York. In 1990, uh, was, well, 1990 or 91, uh, we created state funding for primary care residency programs uh, uh, for doctors coming out of medical school uh, uh, residency programs or how they train for the profession. Uh, and we created special funding uh, for residency programs in primary care, uh, feeling that that would uh, help to boost uh, uh, primary care. Uh, I don't know that it uh, has had uh, you know, how much effect it has had. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever really studied that. Uh, you know, when, when we created the Child Health Plus program, uh, also in, in 1990 or 91, uh, it started out uh, as being a program uh, only for uh, outpatient care. Uh, we started it out small and cheap. Um, and uh, we, we contemplated that as being uh, focused on primary care. Of course, Child Health Plus uh, has now uh, grown considerably uh, since then and, and has gone nationwide. Uh, we, uh, a couple of other states have created commissions uh, like the one that Senator G uh, Rivera and I are proposing uh, to, uh, to try to develop uh, recommendations uh, for uh, expanding and strengthening uh, primary care. Uh, and apparently uh, in those other states, uh, it has had a good effect. Uh, and so we would like to take a stab at that here in New York. Thanks. Oh, great, thank you. And let me turn it over to, um, to you, Senator Rivera. I know you have to have to leave a little bit early, but you know, you've, you've really, talked about health equity ever since I've known you and for a number of years. Um, and really, you know, I would be interested to hear how you think about this bill in, in relationship to sort of your, your body of work around health equity. First, I certainly can't claim to be a supporter of it for 51 years. Just a little, well, bit, shorter than that. <laughs> a little bit shorter than that. But but in all seriousness, yes, that I've, I've always been. So back when I became the uh, ranking member of the health committee, uh, in uh, what is it, 2012, maybe something like that. Uh, the reason that I asked for that role was specifically because I was looking at, at the work that I was doing in, in the Bronx uh, and considering that even, even when I started uh, my, my legislative career, there was already, it was already pretty clear that uh, the impact that unequal access to care has on the communities that I represent. And we were always already talking about that even before I, I became a legislator. So once I became a legislator and I had the opportunity to be part of the, of the health committee and then to be its ranking member and eventually to lead it, it has always been with that at, at, the, at the core. I, I believe that, that equity requires for everyone who is just because they're human beings have access to healthcare. I believe the healthcare is a human right. It's the reason why I support the New York Health Act, uh, but it's also the reason I support this bill. Uh, because it as it relates to primary care, look, not only does it make, you know, for those for those of my colleagues who are interested in this from a fiscal point of view, uh, expanding access to primary care actually makes the system cheaper because it means that you can identify things earlier. You don't have people 
going into uh, to see to see their their medical uh, their you know medical specialists or what have you uh, at the moment when they're in crisis. Instead, you can treat conditions much earlier. So expanding it doesn't only make it cheaper, but it actually provides a better quality of life for people. So this bill would actually make it so that uh, so there's a real comprehensive look at what uh, of, uh, what are the places that we could actually do better uh, as far as primary care is concerned. It would create a commission so it reviews and examines and make findings and recommendations to the Department of Health on how we can actually increase and strengthen spending on primary care and just expand it because I, I believe that for to what for us to achieve equity, uh, primary care is an incredibly important part of it. And so I certainly am thankful for my colleagues or my colleagues staffers who are here, uh, and hopefully we will uh, be able to be able to get on this bill and we'll hope you'll help make us uh, a reality. Things that you said. Um... Dick was really important, which is that you've sponsored a lot of bills over the years. And I think that's true for you too, Gustavo, is that you've sponsored a lot of bills over the years that have addressed pieces of primary care. This is sort of an attempt to kind of step back and say like, let's look at the whole funding, sort of uh, all of the funding for primary care. You know, I, I guess I'd be interested to hear, you know, to hear a little bit more about that. Like why, why that would make a difference in terms of the primary care system in New York State. Well, we just know that health systems that are oriented towards primary care just function better. They just, they just do. I mean, when you have a, when people have more access to primary care providers, it means that they, you know, they are there. You actually said it earlier. This is about moving towards wellness, uh, not just treating illness. It is about moving towards wellness and having access to a primary care provider uh, means that you'll actually be focused on that because you'll be focused on on, on going and getting checked out on a regular basis. You're not going to go to uh, an emergency room. Instead, you are concerned with your, with your health on an everyday basis and not just with like when something is hurting uh, and, and having just access to primary care kind of make sure that you do that. I think one of the things about our system is that we sort of end up having a lot of categorical money, particularly that comes through, you know, the state legislature sort of says, okay, we're going to have a cancer bill. And then here's this, you know, here's cancer funding. And then they have a, a, another bill that's maybe about cardiovascular disease and maybe another bill that's, that's about uh, diabetes. But when you put all that together, you know, at the end of the day, there's a person, right, who has maybe has diabetes or maybe has cancer, but they, they need support on these other issues as well. And so when we have all this categorical funding coming in, I think that's one of the challenges for primary care providers certainly is that, that, that they really wanna treat the whole person um, and not, not, not a person, just the disease entity that you know, it need, needs resources. So I think that's one of the things that we'd, we'd I think love to understand is you know, how much of that funding you know, that comes in for a categorical disease actually does get spent on, on primary care. Um, you know, part of the problem is that uh, you know, to be perfectly candid about it, uh, the hospital world uh, has uh, really extraordinary resources and political clout. Um, you know, every every legislator that I know of, uh, you know, comes to Albany uh, ready to be appealed to by their local hospital. Uh, hospitals are big things that everybody in the neighborhood can see. And so when when you say, you know, community general here in Podunk, uh, you know, needs more money to, to you know, to keep serving Podunk, uh, you know, that that's enormously appealing uh, to legislators and their constituents. And so, you know, this year in, in the state budget, we put, uh, what was it, $800 million dollars uh, into additional uh, funding for safety net hospitals uh, mm -hmm. and major public hospitals. I was glad to do that. Uh, those hospitals certainly need that money, uh, but you didn't have anything like the same uh, clamor uh, to, to say, you know, let's give, uh, you know, some billions of dollars to community health centers. Uh, or to primary care practices. Uh, and when we have been able to, as we were this year, we were able to designate 
uh, some funding in some of the pots of money that we that we legislate uh, to go for community-based providers uh, as as opposed to the big hospitals. Uh, you know, it's a lot less money, and it it only happens with uh, you know a lot of you know pulling teeth by uh, uh, by me and Gustavo. Uh, because you don't have the kind of uh, well-organized and, and broad uh, clamor uh, that funding for hospitals gets. Uh, and yet, you know, if you talk to a lot of individual legislators, uh, they would recognize that, yes, primary care is enormously important. Uh, but when it comes to doing budgets, uh, the clamor, uh, is almost all about hospitals. And hopefully uh, this commission, uh, if we can get it established, uh, can help uh, redirect uh, some of that clamor. And for the record, that teeth pulling that, teeth pulling that, uh, uh, that Dick was talking about just a second ago, is, it's actually, it's, actually out, it's out of pocket, it's not covered. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's even more expensive. <clears throat> Yes, there are copays associated. I'm sure. Oh, big copay. Uh, that you have to uh, to lever. But you know, I think it's interesting. I mean, this year the the governor, you know, originally said that she was going to put ten million dollar, ten billion dollars, excuse me, into healthcare, and and I think we saw that uh, that not very much of it really was designated specifically for primary care. And and mm -hmm. I wonder if that was a conversation that you all were having with your sister and fellow legislators as you were thinking about the budget over the course of this year, and hopefully thinking through, you know, budget possibilities for the, the next round, which, which I know you won't be here for, um, uh, Dick, but, but, but Gustavo, you certainly will be here. And, you know, we would appreciate um, any support you, you have to think about how to, how to do that differently in a, in a next, in, a, in another round. We'll have a chance, we'll have a chance at this every year. So, um, you know, let me, I would like to bring in um, our, our other two voices, and then I want to have a conversation among all of us. Um, you know, I think, um, the voices of primary care doctors, uh, as well as people who need the services, is, is really quite important. And so I want to introduce uh, first um, Dr. Pascal Kersant, who's the chief medical officer at Brooklyn Plaza Medical Center. Um, you know, what's your perspective of working in Brooklyn? You know, Brooklyn is a big city. If, if it was actually a city, it, it would be the fourth largest in the country, I think. So you, you have a, a vantage point about what it, primary care means in this very broad sense, but particularly for the communities that you serve. Um, in, in sort of uh, downtown and central Brooklyn. And tell us a little bit about, you know, your perspective about providing care as a primary care provider. You're quite correct. Um, I've been working in Brooklyn for the majority of my career, trained in Brooklyn, uh, worked in the hospitals in Brooklyn and saw the patients that uh, came in and, and, and noted even early during my training that that was the, the reason patients showed up to the ED, whether it was Kings County, whether it was, um, whether it was downstate or any of the other hospitals, was the fact that there was a lack of primary care because the majority of the patients did not need to uh, be in the emergency department. Having worked in primary care, I'm a, I'm a board certified pediatrician. I've been a CMO for ah, more than 15 years now. Um, and so I see the whole gamut. I see the fact that uh, patients, our patients sometimes they don't recognize that health is, um, is a main concern when they are competing, uh, there's competing issues, housing, uh, uh, work, um, and, and yet they still need to get care. That means that it is up to us to really reach out to our patients and remind them to come in more often. Unfortunately, though, that also means that um, this leads to workforce issues because do we have the amount of work, the, the, the right people, the amount of people that we need to outreach to patients, to get them to come in when they need to come in? Um, so that is something that we struggled with for many, many years. Um, whether it is it, whether it is a patient who is in pediatrics, whether it's uh, our adult patients, uh, these gaps in care really do impact later on. 
Um, I would also say that other issues that we have are, and, when, and I believe uh, uh, Mr. Godfrey talked about it, is the comprehensive nature. Um, we need to have other supportive uh, services. For example, uh, dietitian, nutrition is very important. And at this point in time, looking for staff, uh, salaries have increased, um, requirements have increased. Uh, you need to be a certified diabetes educator now to be reimbursed. All these issues impact us because we're not able to find those people who need, that we need to help uh, provide the, the, the comprehensive care that is necessary. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think that's a great example. You know, it, we know that there's a lot of people in the community who who would be great as you know community health workers and as working with uh, people in their community around the issue of diabetes as a great example. But you know, helping people in the community actually become diabetes certified diabetes educators in order to create that funding stream is a great example of what some additional investment in primary care could be doing, right? Could be supporting developing a local workforce that really has these skills. And then that begins to build sort of wealth and jobs and communities that really then focuses on this sort of whole issue of primary care and, in, and investment, uh, which I think is one of the things that we would wanna look at as, you know, what should primary, what, what should we be investing in to support the primary care workforce? But Louise, uh, nutrition is not just diabetes care. Uh, right. uh, one of the issues I recognize uh, with our prenatal program uh, are that women who come to us, they do not know what healthy nutrition means. So they may not be diabetic. You may not need to have a CDE uh, teach them about what healthy nutrition is. But, is, but are those services reimbursed? At, at this point, they're not. Right, so that is, you know, that's an issue that might be out of, uh, that, that's one of the recommendations that certainly could be made out of this kind of commission, but it's also important to recognize that you do need a variety of different kind of primary care workforce. And we know that growing the primary care workforce is one of the key things that we think there needs to be investment in. So just as Dick was saying earlier that there are monies for residency programs around primary care, you could imagine a whole series of, of programs that could really support the development of those job skills that we know are so necessary to bring into the primary care system, right? That, that, that may not be as available in the community as they are now. You know, having said that, I mean, I wanted to just ask you a little bit about maternal mortality because, you know, we know maternal mortality is really an important issue and it's a particularly an issue for black women, right? Who die at much higher rates, unprecedented and, and unnecessary rates of death. That's really one of the biggest um, issues around health inequities in our in our state and in our country, and it's certainly one of the issues around um, around which everyone is trying to figure out how to how to work. One of the things that I have noticed is that primary care is left out of the conversation about maternal mortality. Right? We have a lot of great programs that are thinking about we should have doulas, or we should have midwives, we should have other um, uh, you know we should uh, do a variety of other things in terms of. Uh, but I think that but it's been proven that primary care is one of the things that actually addresses maternal mortality because it works with women before they're pregnant, while they're pregnant and, and after they're pregnant and really thinks about the whole woman. I'm wondering what you think about that. Do you think that that's a, an issue that um, th that is one of the things that primary care could do very concretely that would really improve the health of the community that you serve? Oh my goodness, I, de I definitely do so. Um, a few years ago, um, the one of the health centers I worked with embarked on a centering pregnancy program which proved to be uh, wildly successful. Uh, the Centering Pregnancy Program is a group visit model, but instead of meeting individually with each patient, uh, our patients in, uh, in the same cohort, the same uh, gestational age met. And uh, there were uh, specific topics. And what we saw in the very first topic was nutrition. And, and that's where we realized that women do not know what, uh, what healthy nutrition is. And, and, and every topic was covered throughout their pregnancy. And what we saw was that women who embarked in that program, who, who got their care through that program, did much better. And were, or, uh, they were, uh, because one, they showed up. That's so important. Uh, if patients are able to come and they feel empowered to take care of themselves better, they do better. 
Yeah, so I think I think that's really right. Um, I, I just want to, um, uh, Gustavo, if you were trying to talk to us, you're on mute. Um, oh no, okay, you're having a different, all right. Do I just want to give you- Stuff is happening over here, stuff is happening. Okay, all right, well, the bill is passing while we're speaking. No, if there's anything- It's on third reading, happening. actually. It's on third reading on my house, so I'm working on it. Great, that's great. Hmm. If there's anything um, that you'd like to say, I know that you have to drop off in a few minutes, yep. but if there's anything you wanted to add before you do, and then I'll turn it over to John Rodriguez. Uh, just, just really quickly, that I'm, cer I'm certainly very thankful for all the folks that are here. If you are here from any of our from any of our colleagues uh, in the Senate or the Assembly, please get on this bill. Uh, it is on the third reading in the Senate, and uh, I'm not sure where it is in the Assembly, but uh, it it is it, it would be important to get it passed because as we've been discussing, I mean, at, at the core of all this is just an understanding of how important it is to achieve true equity, we need to have more broad access to primary care. And this would be a bill that would get us that, that would get us there, because it would mean that we would uh, just have a deep look into the, into the lack of access in the state of New York and the investments that we need to make to make sure that we get the access. And if we do, that's the way we reach, we reach true health equity. And hopefully with our colleagues' help, we can get there. Great, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and we appreciate your sponsorship of this bill. Um, so let me just turn to you, Dr. Ruggie. You know, you're in a totally different community than, uh, than where Dr. Croissant practices. You're up in the North Country, a very rural area. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in primary care up in rural upstate New York? Is there enough primary care? Is it, uh, do you need more? Do you need different things? What, what's going on? I, I dropped into the Adirondacks 48 years ago, not 52 like Dick. and. Um, found myself as a physician in a little town that had lost all three of its GPs that same summer. Um, and then came to learn that all the surrounding towns were about to lose their physicians. They were all retiring at the same time because they were all Jewish and had fled Germany at the end of World War II and the time would come. And so we had the prospect of a, of a huge medical vacuum that terrified me. But how do you leave when there's nobody to replace you? And instead of turning out to be a disadvantage, it worked in our favor because it was a big splotch on the map that anybody could see either from Albany or Washington to say, this area may have no health care. And what about that? And what the local communities understood was if they lost primary care, they lost all of health care locally. And with that, they lost their pharmacy and then they lost the local people going off elsewhere for shopping at their grocery store and all the rest. So um, we had local towns willing to contribute, contribute free office space, heats and lighting. Initially, speaking to Dick's point, we were an extension clinic of the ER, the nearest hospital, Glens Falls, and it didn't work. We had so many uninsured patients, so many Medicaid patients, the hospital was looking at how to give this up without embarrassing itself. We hit upon the community health center program. And thanks to um, meeting all the criteria and having a little time book writing, got our grant and thought that was, that was great. But there were limits, um, all kinds of needs that we kept fi finding that were not, were not really addressed. And Pascal has mentioned some of them, patient education. We couldn't control our diabetics without, without a nutritionist and needed grants for that. We found one. Then um, came prenatal care that pregnant women were qualified for Medicaid, but it took four months to get their card and the OBs wouldn't see them until they had their card. And so a need for, for another grant. And then came behavioral health and yet another grant, um, one, one by one. And one of those grants helped us to start a homebound program so we could do house visits. And then started to realize we were changing the perception of where care can be. Um, Dr. Wei, one of our physicians, had a, had a patient in the hospital for six weeks with heart failure and no prospect of leaving, it seemed. And he finally decided, we got to try her at home. I'll, we'll put her at home and I'll take care of her there. A little while later, I got a call, I got a letter from CMS saying this was an inexcusable, inappropriate discharge. And there were some penalties to follow. In response, he sent a letter off to Washington, you know, not a letter, but a photo of this lady at her kitchen table, <laughs> beaming with pride and delight. And he got a letter back saying, we have to apologize. Care doesn't always have to be given, even for severe conditions in an institutional setting. So coming together, one grant after another, 
fortunately for us at Hudson Air Waters Health Network has been regularized. These, these grants have come together under an expanded notion of what a community health center is. Use of the medical home model where we had commercial payers suddenly participating and boosting beyond just the office visit. And that leads to 340B, taking some of the profits from the pharmaceutical companies and steering them to primary care. So I, I've done the math on the back of my envelope and we now have about 12% of the total healthcare costs of our patients coming to Hudson Hill Waters for primary care. And with that, we're in the top 1% for quality among FQACs around the nation. A study by 3M shows that we're 15% lower in total cost of care for our patients compared to other providers around the Adirondack North Country. And the University of Wisconsin has taken a look at our Medicaid patients and saying they're top rated by way of outcomes. So all that's possible, but it's unfortunately exceptional. It depended on one grant after another and the happenstance of coming together. So the commission that you, Dick, and Gustavo are proposing to set a strategy for how do we bring these dollars together for the best possible use? How do we set a time frame? is wonderful and, and is a consolidating feature for, for all of this. Before I shut up, um, just have to also say about government, you know, this impersonal government ours and how does it work and all the rest. Remember some time ago, actually 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, the feds changed their laws a bit in terms of how to reimburse health centers. And with that, to, to assure funding for the community health centers, they changed the law and the state had to have conforming legislation. The conforming legislation had a hole in it and two health centers in the state were being left out. Rushville for $30,000 a year and Hudson Hill Waters for a million. I went to Dick Godfrey and said, Dick, we, we've got to have help. I'm told by the health department and the governor's office there has to be special legislation for this. I've never imagined such a thing. And Dick's response was, well, sure. But well, we'll, we'll start with a local democratic representative who can who's there to help I said our assembly person is is a Republican and um, it's Teresa Sayward and Dick's response was Teresa oh she's wonderful she just might as well be a Democrat you'll be okay <laughs> and I'm sure Teresa helped but I'm sure Dick was the person responsible for changing that legislation and making it possible for us to survive it would have been a killer and so time and again um, thanks to this vacuum and thanks to the people that we came to know, we've been able to make it. But trying to figure out how to make this not an exception, but the rule, how to make it the norm is the challenge we're facing. And I think the legislation you are proposing and the dental work you're doing is our best chance ever. So thank you very much. You know, John, when you, when you talk about that legislation, um, uh, you know, after we did the piece for Hudson Headwaters uh, to set up a, you know, the uh, a network and and require, you know, well not require but cajole all the various payers to come together and uh, uh, and and pay you fairly. Uh, I put together a bill that took that exact legislation and uh, made it something that the health department. Uh, could replicate all over the state. Um, and we got that enacted, I think, in 2011. Uh, right. And as far as I know, uh, it has gathered dust ever since. And back then, when I first proposed the statewide authorization for that, uh, Deborah Backrack in the, in the health department uh, said it's a it's a great idea, she said. But when we were setting up the Hudson Headwaters thing, uh, I forget the name of the guy in the health department who worked with you. Uh, she said it, it 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 took six practically six months uh, of him almost full time uh, to get Hudson Headwaters set up, and we only have one of him. Uh, That's right, That's Foster right. Foster Gaston, yes. Right. Um, and you know, yeah, it. Getting these things put together, uh, you know, takes an enormous amount of work. 
uh, and uh, and you, there aren't a lot of people uh, in state government who are available to do all of that putting together of all of the pieces. Uh, and again, hopefully a commission uh, can help create uh, you know, some critical mass around some of these ideas. Yeah, another another key. I mean, one one discussion I've heard is, well, why not just have the health department create a commission? Why do we need legislation for this? But the key thing is to is to have a big view that goes across departments, not only DOH but DFS. Um, those those are the people that the payers listen to, and so having this broader view and the attention. Of the, of, a, of the entire legislature upon it is really critical to make a difference. Yeah. Right, so just to, just to let everyone know, the Department of Health in the state oversees our Medicaid program. The Department of Financial Services oversees the commercial payers. And so we really want this all payer approach, right? Because we, we actually think that we don't want a dual system, right? We actually want one standard of care, one standard of care with, uh, with the kind of surround uh, the kind of outcomes, John, that you're talking about and Pascal that you talked about when you talked about the Centering Pregnancy Program, like those are the outcomes that we're looking for because that's what, we're not, we're not doing this because we think that, you know, we just want this sector to make more money because they should make more money. They will make more money because we need more investment because that's what's gonna matter for the outcomes and for people who actually live in these communities to actually have someone who says, oh, I'll take care of you at home or I'll help you with your pregnancy, or I'll look, you know, support you with your diabetes. I'll look at you as a whole person. I'll think of you not just as a pregnant woman, but as a woman in a, in a particular moment in her life. And I'm gonna be here for you before, during, and after your pregnancy. I think that's the standard that we wanna set and that's where we're gonna get the outcomes from. And so I think one of the things that I, that I think is really important about this bill to reiterate is that we really wanna look at the full system and to say, look, what is it that we need to raise everyone up to the level? That, that you were talking about, John. And I'm talking about federally qualified health centers, frankly, hospital ambulatory centers, which may or may not always really provide that level of care, but really in, in some places really is, is a place certainly that provides a lot of primary care, but also independent practices that really are, uh, are, are struggling uh, to make ends meet and who don't have a diabetes educator or a nutritionist or some of these other things. And there is a difference in terms of of how they get paid, but what we want to do is invest so that everyone has the benefit. You know, we're really looking to sort of lift all, all boats here. I mean, I, I do think that um, that one of the the questions I would ask of all of you is, you know, we want to support the existing primary care, but but do you think there still remain gaps in primary care? So Hudson Headwaters, maybe you're taking care of your your kind of corner of the Adirondacks, but but my my understanding is that there are counties that don't have. Uh, a, a federally qualified health center in New York State and that don't have very many primary care providers or who where, where primary care providers are retiring or, or leaving and, and there isn't, you know, you're not there to, to sort of jump in. So, you know, do you see this legislation as being supportive of trying to, to build out other points of access? We're, we're seeing this every month. I mean, two physicians have just, have just left primary care practice in, in Malone, way up north to go catch us to the Indian Reservation. Life is better on the Indian Reservation than it is in the, in the, in the city of Malone or the village of Malone. And so there, there is a continued erosion of primary care that somehow has to be filled. And I, I'm not one to say it shall be community health centers. I, I think having a variety of modes of providing the care is good in terms of exciting physicians, giving them alternatives and all the rest. Um, we do fine with our private practice partners. We do fine with the hospitals that have, have clinics. We just have to be on the same page and the same agenda, doing the same work and doing it together. We're seeing it also downstate. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, providers leaving. We're seeing our nurses leaving. I, I, I'd even mention uh, the difficulty that uh, we're facing now trying to get nursing support. Uh, there, there's no way we can compete with other organizations. Oh my goodness, uh, during the whole COVID pandemic when we were vaccinating, trying to compete hiring a nurse when the city was paying them $90 an hour to give vaccines, it's just, just really upsetting because you realize that the, the services that you can provide to your patients are not getting to that. Yeah, I actually wanna just briefly just talk about COVID because you know, we're not out of the pandemic yet, but, but I think 
we can now look back and say like at the beginning of the pandemic, were there things we could have done differently? And it's my sense that primary care was kind of left out of the whole COVID initial, you know, response. And, and certainly primary care as a whole received a lot less resource. Um, and I'm wondering now, as you look to the future and you see, well, there's long COVID, there's still a continuing need for testing and for treatment and for advice. You know, do you see, how do you see COVID impacting primary care? And do you think that there is a resource gap here for the primary care folks, uh, primary care providers and the, the communities that they serve that could be, could be addressed? John, why don't you start and then I'll- You have to be careful about this, but to say initially, um, the funding was directed all to hospitals and, and the hospitals simply weren't organized to, to disperse this across rural geography. Um, so not only primary care, but also public health needed to become involved and they have been. Um, it, it took a few months and a little failure, but, but subsequently DOH caught on. And, and the result of I have been um, not thousands, but tens of, tens of thousands of tests that we've done and be able to know where the problems are and be able to, to follow them. Um, and, and again, that ability to work in partnership with, with public health is, is absolutely key. It's, it's no one, one place for all this activity. Dr. Prasad, you know, you, no, I'm sorry. Um, part of, part of it was that in, in the early stages of COVID, uh, you know, the common understanding was you get COVID, you have to be rushed to a hospital where they may well be, uh, you know, putting, sedating you and intubating you and, uh, uh, and, and the notion that you would be treated anywhere other than, than in a hospital uh, didn't, didn't seem to occur to anybody. Uh, and, you know, when the federal government was sending money well, where else would you send it but to hospitals? Uh, and so hospitals got a, you know, an awful lot of federal money uh, and all, all the attention, uh, I guess, understandably at that stage of the epidemic uh, was on hospital care. Uh, but, you know, now fortunately, uh, a, a pretty small percentage of, of, of people who get COVID need to be hospitalized. What they really need uh, is a primary care doctor that they can call up and say, I've got these symptoms, uh, how do I get tested and, and what do I do then? Uh, you don't need a fancy specialist for that. You certainly don't need a hospital. But you need a TV screen. What we, what we find is, I mean, one of those new advances is, is how telehealth can actually work. I mean, avoid exposure to other people in the office setting, do the evaluation remotely. And I'm sure that that a good effect of, of COVID is going to be the continued use of telehealth in a way that, that we've not um, mobilized before or even been able to imagine prior to this epidemic. So we, we keep learning. Even in New York City, uh, telehealth does work if you have access to, to <laughs> even in New York City, to, uh, to a, a good IT infrastructure, meaning that uh, does does the individual have enough minutes on their phone? Um, does, it, does the individual actually understand how to utilize? So that means that we would need to, we have to take our staff to train our patients on how to use telehealth. So it does work, but you do also have to provide resources to get your patients up and running. And that's something that was not part of our budget. Another, another rural issue, due to the lack of broadband, we have um, not, not unusually asked our patients, please, please drive to the local parking lot of the town hall and then call us from there. <laughs> so then we can do our televisit together and do a little weird. The, I mean, the reason I wanted to raise this is because I feel like primary care as a system really has not been invested in in terms of preparedness. And, and you know, everyone pivoted incredibly quickly to telehealth, but now we know it's got to be a fundamental component of how we deliver primary care from now into the future. And so we need the infrastructure dollars. And that to me is sort of part of the bigger picture of primary care investment. You know, when we talk about primary care investment and dollars coming in, you know, I always get the question, oh, should we pay primary care providers more? And my feeling is, well, yes, we should, because there's a 76% difference between a primary care provider's salary and a specialist salary. And frankly, I think primary care providers provide an important 
you know, a very unsung but critically important part of the healthcare system, which prevents people from getting ill or supports them in the very, you know, identifies, diagnoses, and supports them uh, to get well, you know, in the early stages of any disease or infection. And so this is really critically important. Um, but I, I think we don't want to lose sight of the fact that that unless we we support our primary care system now with additional investment that could be for telehealth, that could be for workforce, that could be for salaries. You know, I, I think that we're not going to be able to build the kind of robust primary care system that we actually need going into this next period around COVID, but also for future future uh, possible uh, epidemics or pandemics that, that are going to come our way that we may not really know, you know, what the thing is that we're going to need to invest in, but we know we need robust primary care. Um, I mean, I, I do think that we could have seen a different trajectory at the beginning of the pandemic if we'd, we'd really included our primary care workforce in that sort of really de-stuffing de the emergency rooms with primary care being robust, but we didn't have the mechanisms to do it, and now we do. So it's really, I think, but it, we need to continue to support that infrastructure, um, which is, which is I think, critical. So I guess, you know, we're kind of, sure. I, I, I have to sign off because I've got another thing I've got to go to. But before I do, I, I, I just wanted to pass on a, a, a way of thinking about this that, you know, back in 1990, uh, a whole host of primary care providers and advocates uh, lobbied us to, on, on, on the issue. John, I, I, I think you may have been one of them. Um, and one of the things they stressed to me was uh, thinking about primary care as, uh, you know, the familiar model of a three-legged stool, uh, the three Ps, people, places, and payment. People meaning you got to get doctors and, and nurse practitioners and whatnot to go into primary care. Uh, places, they need places to practice, whether it's private practice or community health centers, what have you. Uh, and finally, they need to be paid. Uh, and if you want if you want there to be people doing primary care, if you want them to have places to deliver it, you have to make sure that there's payment. So the three of them are all interchanged. And I've always found that three-legged stool model uh, a helpful, helpful in, in analyzing the, the policies. Uh, and we need all three. Absolutely. And so this bill hopefully will provide us with the opportunity to think about infrastructure and paying for those three Ps, which which I think is 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 exactly what we want the bill to do. And one, um, one point, payment map paying for office visits because that's what that was what was visible. Now so much care is being given in other ways through care management, through longitudinal care, through telehealth, that we need to pay for care, not for visits. Right. We need to think yeah. about a different payment system. It has to be bigger, yeah. but that's I think part of the conversation that we can have when we have people coming together across the state who are really focused on primary care. So okay. I want to thank you. I'm going to sign off. Your support and thank you very much. And uh, just give a chance for uh, either John or Pascal to give any last comments that you want to give about the importance of this particular um, approach to investing in primary care. And then we'll, we'll sign off and, and thank you to all of our our listeners who uh, we want to support the bill if you're in the legislature and to, uh, to as Dick said, bring a voice uh, if you uh, if you are not in the legislature, bring a voice to support this bill. Any last words from either one of you about about your about your work in primary care? I, I would I would say thank you to PCDC. Part of my work in primary care is I'm the board, and just to see people coming together in the interest of primary care, not necessarily they're, they're doing it all themselves, is is really key and convening in the way you've done the, the leadership of the legislature to show they're being appreciated and to point direction is, is absolutely um, key and important. So thank you. Thank you, um, Pascal. Thank you. Right. thank you so much. Well, listen, thank you both. And we're, you know, we look forward to continuing to work with you. And, and this bill is one piece of, of, of the work that we do, but we think it's really important. And it's been done in a number of states around the, um, around the, uh, the country. And, and in terms of the bill, um, I, I, uh, I, I have, it's, a, it's bill A7230A and in the Senate S6534B. 
and we look forward to all of you uh, making some noise about this and please talk to your legislators and send letters and postcards and and give them a call and and text and tell them that that we we need we need your support so uh, please please also take a look at our PCDC website and and uh, join us in the conversations that we have on Twitter or on Facebook and and on LinkedIn and we really appreciate your uh, your time today and thank you all for joining us thank you very much Thank you. take care